Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Culture Wave Media Network. If you guys are returning to this, this is me, Darian Scalamoni, the founder of the network, as well as the person who runs a lot of the channel. Um, for the new people that are tuning in for the first time, please be sure to, if you guys like film and television reviews, you guys like news in the industry, we're doing a bunch of other things, including game shows and other things in the entertainment realm. Please be sure to go down below and hit subscribe. We are on the lookout for 500 subscribers right now. We're on our way. Please be sure to leave comments on our videos and like our stuff. That's how we start to generate more of an audience and we're able to do more content for you guys. But please be sure to help us on the hunt for 500 subscribers. Now check out our review for The Fall Guy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinema Wave podcast. We are here to talk about the newest movie in theaters called The Fall Guy that stars Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt, as well as Aaron Taylor Johnson, Hatta Waddingham, Stephanie Zhu, and Winston Duke. I am one of your hosts. My name is Darren Scalamoni, and I am joined by Liz Seiko. Hello. Hello. And we're here to talk about this movie, which is written by Drew Pierce and directed by David Leach. Um, for people who are fans of the action genre, you obviously would know David Leach because he's directed a lot of um sort of the bigger action films the last few years he did bullet train last year he also worked on the john wick films early on and he did atomic blonde with charlize theron so this is his um this is his shot at like another a big blockbuster and this time he's got gosling and blunt who are two of they were always known names but i think that their star trajectory is is kind of reaching a new apex gosling had Obviously, Barbie last year, which was the biggest movie of the year, and he got an Oscar nomination for it. And then you have Emily Blunt, who I... Um, Oppenheimer. Yes, but I'm pretty sure it was her, it was also her first Oscar nomination. Mm -hmm. So also kind of put her in this different stratosphere. Um, but opening thoughts, Liz, I don't know if this is a movie you would usually go to the theater to see, but I'm curious on what your thoughts were on The Fall Guy. So I will start by prefacing that I don't watch action films. They're not something that I lean toward. Just like some viewers don't really like scary or horror films. I don't really tend to lean toward action. I have nothing against it. It's just not my cup of tea, you know? That's why I'm very um, excited to do this review. So I honestly went in with super low mid expectations for myself. Not for the movie, just I was kind of going in thinking that I was going to be bored or just over it. And I was pleasantly surprised, Ooh, DJ. Yay. I had a good time in this film. Awesome. Um, and that I, makes me so happy. Yeah, no I, I really did. And I think it's because it was a little bit of like a meta film in the way that it's a film about a film being made. And that's what I liked about it is watching a film set pretty mm -hmm. much. Um I enjoyed that it was almost just a love letter to the stunt community too, mm -hmm. which I appreciate. I've taken stunt classes before and to actually see uh, it just being given the credit that it deserves. I really enjoyed that aspect. I think if you took that element out of this film, I wouldn't have liked this movie as much. I think I would have been bored and been like, okay, it's a typical, typical action film. But I think that the love that they gave to the community really is what brought me into it. Um, I will say the thing that it falls into though, and it didn't make me completely love it is that it is a typical action movie to a certain extent because they, in my opinion, let go of the plot and storyline a lot. And they just try to focus on the action, which that's a typical action movie. Some mm -hmm. They kind of put the plot on the back burner a little bit for me. So pleasantly surprised, not blown away, but better than I expected. Okay. So I agree with a lot of what you said. I'm really glad you brought up the point that – because I think it's not only a love letter to stunt performers, but I think it's a love letter to cinema. There's a lot mm -hmm. of really um, aware nods and uh, like you said, the meta-ness of sort of what this movie is. Um, in terms of just the the film industry in general, um, I think that the the thing is also David. I don't know if you knew this or not, but David Leach, the director, is a former stuntman. I, yeah, so I did. being able to have somebody like him at the helm of this, I think, brings it to a whole nother level of just how much commitment there is to this sort of story. Um, and I will disagree a little bit because, and I'm like, I'm a big proponent of action films. Like I, I watch know, a lot that's of why them. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, but I do think that what separated this for me, um, other than some other like regular sort of action films and bring it to a different level for me, 
is that the chemistry between Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling to me is like incredibly palpable. Like I thought that um, it was very believable. I thought that there was really adorable yet realistic banter and playfulness between like the games they were playing with one another. And uh, they've been doing like a lot of press together because they were in the awards circuit together with the whole Barbenheimer thing. And Emily Blunt showed up to his monologue at Saturday Night Live. And, and it's obvious that they've become pretty good friends, not only maybe because of what happened there, but also because they shot this movie together. Um, so to me, that was a standout in terms of this movie. Like I would say that I probably like their chemistry even more than the action scenes in the movie. Mm. Um, I really love the whole uh, side-by-side sequence that they have in the film where they're on the telephone. I really enjoyed that whole sequence. I thought it was great. Um, but – yeah, as a whole, I also – I didn't go into this movie with crazy high expectations, but I'm a huge Gosling fan. Like I just – I don't know if I've ever seen something that I really didn't like him in. Um, and I love that he's able to do sort of all these different kinds of characters. And there is a bit of Ken in this. Like I you felt can, it. Yeah, like there – but that, that's so much of – who I think – I don't know if you saw some of his quotes during their press, all the press they've been doing. But he said like he wants to now do films that his children can watch. And he doesn't want to do things okay. in which he wants to play some of these darker characters. Um, and it's a conversation that him and his wife, Eva Mendez, have had. And he's gone to dark places before. Like, he's played a skinhead. Yeah. Like, he's played terrorists. Like, he's he's done he's done the, the grimy shit. He's played murderers, like, serial killers all throughout a very long career already. And I feel like there's so much more to go with him. So it was nice and fun to see him sort of play in this box because – even like I can't recall off the top of my head like him doing a major action movie. Like I don't think besides uh, the one that he had done for Netflix a couple of years ago, which a lot of the Gray Man, which kind of went over a lot of people's heads. I didn't watch um, it. But so much of what he's done is is very character specific. Mm-hmm. And like again, he'll do things like the Nice Guys, which is like an action comedy. But like he's he's more of a character actor. Like he and I felt like and it seems like even on the press tour, like Gosling had so much fun doing a movie like this and even in t- like in terms of Emily Blunt too she i think has shown a real ability to pretty much do anything she wants to i mean she led i don't know if you've ever seen cuz again i know you're not a huge action movie fan but the movie Edge of Tomorrow which was a sci-fi action movie with her and Tom Cruise i don't think so but that was a movie that like she had never done an action movie before and it was it it was very reminiscent of like It was a very powerful female character in action movies, which is always great to see. And like female, like like examples like Ripley and like Alien, like you don't get that as much as you should. Mm -hmm. And Emily Blunt like personified that. And I did think in this movie, even though she doesn't do a crazy amount of action, she still had that kind of in her back pocket. And she did a really great job of playing this um, director, getting a shot for her first film while still playing in that real like chemistry between her and Gosling. So that was what was a major focus to me. Um, again, I think this is back to back movies where I am going to be more on the side of you where like this movie could have used some cuts. Um, but I do understand, especially in terms of like the action sequences when you're, you're, when you're kind of making this a palette of like, this is going to be the ultimate stuntman movie. Like you want the action to be sort of front and forward. Yeah. So it made sense to me, but um, I had a really fun time with this movie. Like to, I did too. Yeah. That's why I was like not hating on it because I can't say that I had a bad experience watching it. Um, it was definitely I kind of knew what was happening towards the end before you even got a hint of it, which is what leads me to think that they needed a little bit more. I think would have taken this movie from good to great is if they put the attention that they needed into the script a little bit more. I know what you're talking about within the beginning where um, Gosling and Blunt are talking like a little ad libby almost Mm -hmm. kind of like having a little bit of banter. I didn't mind that in the beginning, but then I started getting sick of it after about 30 minutes in because it felt like to me they were just making shit up kind of in the middle of a scene rather than having a tight script. Mm. And I always appreciate a tight script that can then flip and have an incredible action scene because it means that you had people on both spectrums delivering their best work. If you have a loud, a, like a lazy verbiage going on for me, it just seems that that got put on the back burner. Yeah. I think it was definitely more of an experiment and an exercise for them to just play. 
Mm-hmm. I think, and I think that there are times in the movie where it comes off, um, like you said, a little lazy. It can come off as something that isn't particularly being sold as authentic to the audience. Um, but I still think for the most part, the chemistry between the two of them was there, which I appreciated. Um, I felt that a lot in terms of, uh, but I, again, I understand the meta-ness of it. Like, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson's character of Tom Ryder is like, is a lot. He's a lot. He's a lot. He is. And, and the thing is, cause I really, do, I think he's a very underrated actor. Um, I think like him in, uh, Outlaw King, I don't know if you've seen it and him in Nocturnal Animals are like really, really tight, great performances by him that are very different than like, uh, and I know you're not a huge superhero movie fan, but like the characters he plays in like comic book roles, like in Kick-Ass or in something like the Avengers films, like he has the ability to do different things. I think there's, that's a big part of the reason why he's like the front runner for James Bond right now. Like people want to see him lead something. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this film, I, I, it, it didn't, it didn't land. It for didn't you? work for me. It was, okay. you know, who I actually really liked in the film that was Hannah Waddingham. Uh, okay. Um, and I don't know if you felt similarly, but like I, um, I've watched her in Ted Lasso. I'm, I'm not through Ted Lasso, but I watched two seasons of it and I love her character in it. And this is, uh, it was just a fun, silly villain. Like it felt yeah. very like throwbacky. And um, I'm not sure if you had known this or not. And this is an interesting kind of question that I have for you too. Um, this movie is based on an old television show from the 80s. I did now, know Now the that. 80s is a very particular time for a lot of interesting sort of uh, liberties, creative liberties across television, especially television at that point. Um But at the same time, this kind of felt a little bit more original to me in terms of like, I guess, and I don't even know if it's a blockbuster because the budget, it's still a higher budget, but it's not like a blockbuster budget, I guess. Um, But how did you feel in terms of them like adapting something that came before? Because to me, it felt like if you're going to take IP driven stories, this is the way to do it. Like they modernized it. They were able to like, have some re- like I loved. Uh, there's one line in the movie where um, the one guy's talking about uh, the drug dealer goes to him and he goes, "You're a stun guy." He goes, "They give Oscars for that yeah. because that's such an obvious thing in Hollywood that people are like, how are we not honoring mm-hmm. these people that are putting their lives on the line every single day yeah. for all of these things?" So I'm curious on what your thoughts are in terms of like the IP driven focus on like, is this the way that we can sort of start to combat that everything is so IP driven by like taking a piece of IP that existed previously and like very, 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 very loosely adapting it. Or if you think that like, we need to just stop with IP driven stuff being at the forefront. Mm, uh, I am very mixed on that question because I think there's nothing wrong with taking a kernel of something that's already been created and then reimagining it. But I think it comes from the creative team or director having a personal connection to that original story. Mm-hmm. And for this example is that uh, the the director was a stuntman. And so he obviously has a whole connection and a love for that. And it's not just somebody that's like, hmm, that was an interesting movie that I watched, but I'm going to remake it because I think I can do better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's pointless. Nobody wants to see that anymore of just remaking something just for profitability. Um, I think the reason that this worked and I also think that most people, if they didn't research the film, wouldn't know that it was a, mm-hmm. a, taking something from a prior film. Um, but I also think maybe because it was being recreated that they maybe got a little lazy then of like, oh, let's just like retell this story and make it a little bit more funnier and modern with cooler stunts and having the greatest stunt team probably ever made and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Like the flaw for me in this film is it, and I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel this way that they, when setting up the script and setting up the overall outline of this, were like, you know what? I want to have a stunt where somebody free falls from a helicopter. I want a stunt where a car rolls. I want a stunt where somebody catches on fire and I want a stunt where what's another big one that they did like a big fight scene. Mm -hmm. And they were like, that's what we'll start with. Now, how do we make a story that connects all four of those big events 
and make it entertaining. Mm -hmm. And with these two big Hollywood leads, yeah. now let's fill in the spots, which is just so backwards for me because I'd much rather watch a film that starts with a kernel of a story and then organically has these stunts come out of that storyline rather than almost artificially making the storyline happen. Yeah. And I think that's what, not to get too like crazy nerdy, but it's like, I think, and I totally agree with you. I think that's a big part of the reason why I like so much of the early days of the Marvel movies because so much was based on the fact that like Iron Man started as a character story in dealing with this guy who was a, a playboy who was a drunk and he was trapped in a desert and he had to find his way out of there. Mm -hmm. And he had to um, reap the benefits of all the shit that came before and be aware of all the, the trauma that he's endu endured for all these other people. And they were eventually able to interweave a, con a really incredible interconnected story with the action sort of facilitating it. I definitely agree with you. And it, I do think so much of what happens in this movie and why it, it, it works, like even for you, who's not as much of a fan of it, is because of the personalities. Like you have very big personalities in this movie yeah. throughout all of the characters. And I think that the story gets a little overcomplicated and in places where it doesn't need to because they're trying to shove so much into the sandwich, mm -hmm. so to speak. So I definitely agree with you there. Um, but to me at the same time, and, and I don't want to like act as if I, I was David Leach in the room. I don't know what he said, but I have like a feeling that what happened was he always wanted to make a movie about like what he endured in mm -hmm. Hollywood because – as we said, we've already said multiple times now on the pod, like stunt performers are not given um, their day in the sun. And this is like, this is by, I mean, you're getting Ryan Gosling to star in your movie about a stunt man. It's a big, it's a big deal. Big deal. Yeah. Um, and I think that David Leach always wanted to make a movie like this. And then one day he came across the fall guy, which was a big enough IP. And it's not a major one. Cause it was, again, it was a television series in the eighties, but it got five seasons. So it got over a hundred episodes. People watched it. People are aware of it. Um, people remember what it was, not us, obviously. We weren't even born when the show came out. But um, it was enough that there was an old Hollywood producer that said, I remember the Fall Guy. You want to redo the Fall Guy? And he's like, yeah, we're just going to do it with Gosling. And they were like – And they were like – Enough said. I think we can do something with that. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's so fucked up to say that. <laughs> but it's like I bet you Leach has had this story for years. I bet he's always wanted to make something along mm -hmm. the lines of what this movie eventually became. And because he got to attach an IP to it, that's how the movie got made. He still managed to make the movie for $130 million where probably a few years ago this movie would have been made for 200 and they would have been in really deep shit. And that's not to yeah. say that um, this movie might not still be in an interesting conundrum, which we can get to later. Um but we can focus again on the on the sort of the story and things like that. Um, I want to talk to you about the performances. Like, what did you think about uh, the two leads in particular? I liked them together. I thought they had great charisma, a lot of like connection between the two of them. It looks like they were having fun, which then gives the audience like the space to also have fun. Um, my one thing is. <laughs> And I might get hate for this. I think they thought they were funnier than they were. Okay. I think there was a part of them as an actor who were like, oh, that was funny what we just did. And like, I was like, it would have been funny if like you guys weren't <laughs> laughing at yourselves in the scene. Do you know what I mean? Or did yeah. you not do no, you not feel I, that way? I, here's the thing. I totally understand where you're coming from, but I do think. And maybe I'm just the asshole eating the popcorn. But it's like <laughs> this is the version of Gosling that a lot of – and this is this is another very reminiscent of like what the industry is now, which is a shame. But people want to see Gosling do shit like this. Like this is the version do of – Do they? Yes. Do they? Yes. Because I'll get – like I'll give you examples. Like um, here's a movie that I really appreciated – and uh, it took me a couple of watches to really like enjoy it even more. But like First Man was a movie that Gosling did after La La Land. Okay. Where he plays a charming, like, again, very charismatic guy. That, that That's like, uh, it's not like the character from La La Land is the exact same as the Fall Guy. But there are similarities in his performances from La La Land to Barbie to the Fall Guy. You can see the DNA mm -hmm. baked in there that that is a version of Gosling that exists. 
Then you have like the first man Gosling, which is like very reserved. And he's able to play this really important character by playing Neil Armstrong. I think it's Neil Armstrong, right? Did he plays in, 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 yeah. Um, and even like Blade Runner, like Blade Runner is something where like his character is much more reserved and those movies don't do as well. And there's a reason for that. Like it's, it's not, it's nothing against Gosling's ability. Cause I think he's a fantastic actor and I think he can do anything that he wants, but this is the version that they want to see of him. And I think that it is a little worrisome. No, I don't disagree on this. I like, let him have fun. Let him make these fun movies, especially if he's trying to make it for his family. Mm. But if you're going to commit to these types of films, stay in it. Like one of the moments that I really wanted to enjoy, but I just couldn't because I saw them like laughing at themselves or laughing at the scene was when he's sitting in the car crying, listening to Taylor Swift. Like that's a hysterical moment or also like kind of sad. But the whole time I just was like, Gosling's like giggling inside right now yeah. because he knows that this is funny, which then makes it not funny. I think it was weird that they pointed more attention to that. Yeah, yeah, like I like, don't she's know. Like, you listen to Taylor Swift, and he's like, "Yeah, she's a great artist." It's like, which again, bat. If that's real writing, horrible writing. I feel like, but I'm not gonna lie. But to I don't you. think it is writing. I, I'm not gonna disagree with you, but I'm also not gonna lie that my theater was laughing at shit like that. No. Yeah, it's pop. Like I'm saying, like that. Now we sound too highbrow, but it's like this is this is fun like this movie just it is it just, i'm having fun just, I'm having this fun. movie radiates like the energy of like just a uh, again like popcorn energy. yeah like it's just popcorn like okay. it's just like I'll let this movie is popcorn you know what i mean like if i want a really great steak dinner i'll sit down and i'll watch past lives you know what i mean like and and i'm not trying to give an excuse for the movie but there are different movies for different audiences for different reasons, right? This movie is trying to hit that specific target of we're going to have Ryan Gosling lead an, an action rom-com with Emily Blunt. And we're going to see how this goes. And it's not attached to Marvel. It's not attached to Star Wars. It's not attached to Lord of the Rings. And they're able to do something that despite the fact that it's an IP thing, they're – able to sort of evoke this reaction that the audience, like after leaving, it wasn't like I left the movie and people were like disappointed. Like I left and I was like, I feel like at least everybody had a good time. No, I had a good time. Exactly. But I don't think I had a good time because of their like romance in the movie. I think I had a good time because of, again, the attention that they gave to stunts. Like my favorite part and what I kind of wanted more from it was when they were showing us probably about like the 25% range of when they were, uh, of the film um, of when they were showing us how film stunts actually get done in films, mm -hmm. how Gosling, although he was doing it as like a distracting way, he was like feeling the sand of like, oh, the sand doesn't feel good enough to be able to drive a car on here yeah. and do like a, a car roll. Like, that's crazy. I don't know that. Or to actually show him inside the car and what he has to do in order to make the car roll. Yeah. And then he like. That to me is much more interesting. And if you're going to make a love letter film to the stunt community, do that. That they put in stuff that they actually have to do and don't just make it like a, a romance. Uh, this is a rom com, but a, that's a rom com. I know, and I that totally, turns into like uh, get the villain. Yeah, I get it. I totally understand. And I, I can understand. But that's plot. Yes. You know, that's plot. And that's what I was saying before is I think that if they had given more attention to the plot and storyline, this would have been a great film, not a good film. Yeah, because well, I also don't I don't know if their main focus was really on him. I think the focus is on the romance and what he's constantly chasing with her. But then it gets it gets distracted by the ending of like making it into this big epic. I know. Like battle. And then it's like, so what are we doing? That, are we that making, was my least. But maybe that's just action thing. movies, and like, it, I just again, I don't love it, action. Well, yeah, movies. and it can it can get to that. It can get monotonous. It can definitely get to the point where it's like, I just sat here and watched an hour and a half straight of action. <laughs> and I do think I, I think I've also become more hyper aware of it now. Like, where you don't need just action piece upon action piece piled on top of more action pieces. Like, you don't need that. Mm -mm. to sell your movie or to do like because people are getting tired of that like general audiences are getting tired of that um which i do think is a good transition point to talking about the audience like this movie like i said it has a 130 million dollar budget okay 
It made $28 million opening weekend domestic. It made $66 million opening uh, weekend um, internationally. Now, in the current sort of system of what theaters are post-COVID, post-strikes, and a movie that is not a Marvel movie or is not attached to a major franchise, I think it's a really good opening coup for the movie worldwide. However, what they have coming up the ass of this movie with Planet of the Apes, If, which is going to be a very big movie because it's directed at kids, and Furiosa, I don't know where this movie can make more money. Mm. That's my concern. Now, the movie has a $130 million budget, which means realistically it probably needs to make 180 to break even. So... Do we think it gets there? Do we think, like, how do we feel? I could see this movie um, getting a little bit more of, like, a revival if it hit. Do we know where it's going next after this? Is it going Netflix? I'm not sure. If it goes Netflix, I think it'll have a nice revival. I don't know if it's... Because it's um, the movie is like if it's universal. The runtime is not horrible. They definitely should have made it under that two hour mark so that people are then tempted when they're just sitting at home on a Friday night to be like, "Ooh, less than two hours, boom, put that baby on." The two, I think it's two oh seven was the runtime. They could have cut literally nine minutes off. Um, so I think it will universal, which I think you think it's going. I think it goes Peacock. I think it's gonna have a miss then if it goes to Peacock. Yeah, I mean it's not gonna be it's not gonna be a Netflix movie. Netflix is uh, Sony, which is so because here's so here's another thing. The only way the only two platforms that I think it will do well on would have been Netflix and uh, maybe Prime, but only if they put well, it. Prime as they could get like the VOD sales. I don't think people will pay to watch it. Interesting. Uh, so here's my here's my question too. Like I still haven't seen anyone but you. I know that Zach, who's producing the episode, has seen it. Have you seen it yet? Okay. That movie not only was massive on Netflix since it got added to Netflix, but it grossed a shit ton of money against a way smaller budget. It's not an it's not an action rom com. That's why the budget obviously gets ballooned. I just as I'm reading the Wikipedia page, this movie actually set the Guinness World Records for most canon roles performed in a car. So like doing stunts like they did is going to bring your budget up. Yeah. Not on top of the fact that you're getting Gosling and Blunt coming off Oscar nominations. Like mm-hmm. it's going to cost your, your movie a lot of money. Um, and the character, like the, the supporting actors are not nobodies. <laughs> like yeah. Hannah Waddingham is an Emmy winner. Aaron Taylor Johnson has been nominated for Golden Globes. Like Winston Duke was in the Black Panther movie. Stephanie Shue was coming off everything everywhere all at once. She has a very, very, very small mm-hmm. part in this. So – when they were able to do things like that. So my thing is like, what is separating the audience from seeing something like a no hard feelings or an anyone but you, which like Jennifer Lawrence, obviously a big star, definitely of the same magnitude of Gosling, maybe bigger, probably bigger, but like Sydney Sweeney and, and Glenn Powell are just like very much of the moment. But Gosling to me, I feel like just, and blunt even now to this point, kind of like has that range of like anybody has seen them in anything at this mm-hmm. point. Emily Blunt played Mary Poppins. So it's like kids know who Emily Blunt is. She was in Jungle Cruise. Like Ryan Gosling has done everything under the sun. So what is the problem with people not going to the theater more to see this pairing? Because that's what I'm curious about. I think it comes a little bit into marketing because, um, I mean, I try not to watch trailers too much, but of course I end up seeing them just from life. And... Fall Guy for me was a little bit like, so is it a comedy? Is it a rom-com or is it an action movie? Like it was a little bit of like, it's all of them versus these other rom-coms. They know what they are and they're coming in strong and they're coming in saying like, we're a romantic comedy and that's what we're labeling, labeling ourselves as versus when you start throwing in like action with romance and making it a very heavy comedic trailer which I don't know why they made themselves like try to make it such a comedic trailer when like it's kind of a funny movie. It's not like a laugh out loud slapping like your friend next to you like, oh, my God, that's hysterical. Yeah. So I think maybe that's it is that they just didn't market themselves correctly. Interesting. Do you feel different about no, that? No, it's just I, I don't know. To me, to me, I would think that that this pairing, especially coming off of what they came off of last year, would be enough to 
kind of get a bigger opening. And I'm now I'm worried in terms of how much money the movie's actually going to make. Um, the other thing that I actually just saw, I think it was on the playlist.net. But it could still do well if it goes to a platform. It could. But again, that's not helping. It's, it's not I, helping. It's getting money back, really. Also, as much as ever, you guys make fun of my runtime thing, anyone but you was an hour and 44. No, uh, I get I, it. I think nobody wants to watch no, I actually two saw hour it. movies. This is a anymore. great point. Nobody wants to watch this them. This is a great point, And I want to. Bring Unless it's like a franchise or something that you've been waiting for that is connected to a huge director's name. Nobody has the time to wa sit down and spend two hours watching something anymore. How, much, how long was Barbie? Barbie was over two hours, right? Barbie was about two and a half, but I mean, like, you're talking. No, I know. I mean, it's bar it's it's a whole different thing. Um, no, un an hour fifty four was Barbie. Oh, there you go. Like the, that's the key to the viewership is under two hours. I'm um oh is that said? Here we go. March fourteenth. This is from IndieWire. Two third. Oh no. This is this is a different thing entirely. Um, this says two thirds of U.S. adults would rather wait to watch movies on streaming, which is a big thing. I will say, like, um, yeah, like a new uh, Harris X study finds that the new Roadhouse and literally every Netflix movie may have the right idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I had seen something recently, and I can't find it right now. Um, but it was it was something saying that I think it was like sixty seven percent of people would rather watch movies under two hours nowadays i would yeah and, and I, i'm <laughs> I saying and i, I totally, love movies i but... totally i totally understand that part of it um and i don't disagree with you i do think that this is a movie that didn't necessarily need to get to the two hour point like even some of the upcoming blockbusters like kingdom for the planet of the apes i think is around two and a half which i still th i think it's more because people are clamoring because they haven't seen a movie in that franchise in seven years that yeah that movie is 225 let's see furiosa which is coming out in a couple weeks that uh two and a half two hours 28 so it's going to be interesting to see how those movies perform as well because those are like big gambles like i mean well kingdom of the planet of the Apes, kingdom for the planet of the eights cost less than this movie did which is very interesting that's a whole other thing that it's cost 100 million it's because There's this no movie stars. was doing a lot of at live action stunts yeah. they weren't using any or they used some cgi not like a yeah, lot yeah. though you know um no but i think runtime man they should cut nine minutes off. i agree come into that 150 159 the cutting time. queen might be onto something everybody we might have we might have the cut queen really coming for us this year i'm just saying nobody we live at a time where everybody watch people watches stuff at home where they can hit pause, go to the bathroom. We also live at a time where everybody is only watching reels. And if it doesn't hold your attention for more than five seconds, you're going to the next one. How do we expect the film audience to sit for a like three hour movie? That's that's a fair point. You can't. That's a fair point. You can't. Unless it's actually a masterpiece, <laughs> which most three hour movies are not masterpieces. I know. So uh, that's, I guess my next question, it's like, so do we never have movies over two hours? Do we just go like under two no, hours? No, I think, three hours? Like, okay. I think Oppenheimer is over two hours. Should, yeah, it's could have been hour over movie. two hours. Yes. Should it have been three hours? Absolutely not. But that's a movie that I would say, yes, it needs to be over two hours. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What's another movie? That's like Maestro was a long movie. Oh, see, my show would have benefited from being 150, like in that higher, higher one. The holdover is 213. I know. Like cut that. Cut, cut, cut. Come on. Interesting. <laughs> Past lives is probably under two hours. Right? Absolutely. It is. Yeah. Hour 45. <laughs> Why do you, I'm telling you, movies that I enjoy <laughs> She's on it. under two hours. The cut queen is on it. <laughs> snip, snip, snip. But, okay, so, like, bigger franchise movies. I don't know why I just keep thinking of Lord of the Rings. Like, those movies deserve to be over two hours because they have so much to unpack in them. Sometimes. Like, Marvel, I think, can benefit sometimes from cutting. But there's, like, again, like, Avengers Endgame needed to be the runtime that it was. Um, yeah. But it that was crazy what just happened. Yeah. The whole thing moved. That's fine. <laughs> People, you don't know what just happened behind the scenes. Um, but, but, like, yeah, okay, I, I, can, I wonder I what... understand that. I know you guys aren't probably that excited about the Wicked movie, but I wonder if they've announced what that runs. But so, all right, so that's another interesting thing. So these movies, and here's another example. Now we're not even like on the. Top we're not of even this on the fall guy, but this <laughs> is taking us down a different direction. Like uh, Kevin Costner has the Horizon movies coming out this year, which I don't even know how those are going to be because they're both 
three, basically like two and a half to three hour westerns. And they're both like there's part one and part two. Yeah. And Wicked is going down that route of doing a part one and a part two. So I think it'll be. Is under- that the new way to do movies? But like that is like that's not. I. <laughs> I can't speak on Wicked. Wicked is a totally different thing because the argument is that defying gravity, which everybody is like believing that they're going to end on, is literally the height and peak right before intermission. And it is just like everything. So they want to end the first film on a high because then it's like, okay, you have the big defying gravity moment. How do you continue the story from that point? So I understand that argument. Do I not think it's going to be good? I don't know yet. But to like break up a random Western movie, like why? Yeah, I don't know. Why? <laughs> so mad. Like I don't understand. No, I get it. I don't understand. I, do. I totally get it. Um, we've, I just think we've gone off the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, bit. I think this movie would benefit from cutting and going to Netflix. But I don't – they can't cut anymore because the film's out and I don't think it's going to Netflix. Yeah. Um, is there anything else we can talk about with this movie? I mean, like the I said – The music. I had a good time with the music. Yeah. I mean it's very it's very in-your-face pop music, which mm-hmm. like, that also could have inflated their budget a little bit because they use a lot. I mean getting all too well, even for as mm-hmm. little as they did when it was like the biggest song of last year probably cost them a pretty penny. Um, but – I don't know. It's also it's also Universal, so I think they own the rights. Maybe I don't know if she's a part I of don't UMG. Know. I but, don't know. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, again, being a love letter to st- the stunt profession, I think is really cool. It was a big part of the reason why um, this movie kind of touched us in a certain way because of the meta ness of it and mm-hmm. the love letter to cinema in general. And I think that's probably a big part of the reason why Gosling and Blunt wanted to do it as well. Um, yeah, of course. So. I mean, all in all, I don't know if there's really too much more to talk about in terms of the movie. I did have a question for you. Yes. Did you like the like Dune, Dooney film inside the yes, film? Yes, <laughs> yes. And they, and they, the score, whoever did the score for the movie, um, there's a very obvious like. Like Odom to it. Yeah. And yeah. it's awesome. It's so good. I want to, I want to credit the uh, composer. Let's see. Who did the composition for this film? Dominic Lewis. Um, so shout out Dominic Lewis, mm-hmm. um, really, really fun, uh, nod to the Dune movies. Um, and yeah, how much money did Dune make? Oh, I don't know. But or see, so like Dune, that's the, that's a film that, yes, it deserves to be in the two hour. It deserves to be in the two hour mark. Makes sense. Um, at this point, if you're listening, you probably have like seen the whole film. So like if I spoil it, whatever, but did you stay for the end of credit? Yes. And watch all okay. the, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So and then was... you saw that like ending part where he like blows himself up. Gosling? No. The like uh who what John uh Taylor Aaron Taylor Johnson? Mm-hmm. No, I didn't see that. You so you didn't say the Was whole... that like the post credit? Yeah. There was no. a po- because we were leaving and some guy in the back, no idea who he was, he was like, There's a post credit, you should stay. And we were like, <laughs> Okay. We were like, Okay, like we'll watch it. Um and pretty much it was just a small gimmick. It was uh the two the the police come and are like, You're under arrest and uh, the, his character starts being like, these are fake cops, like get out of here. And he starts running to the pyrotechnic area where it clearly says a sign like no cell phone use. And he's like, I'm calling my agent, like all of you, I'm going to sue. And then he blows himself up because he was using his cell phone near the pyrotechnics. And then the police officer is just like, fucking actors. And like, I like that. it's funny. Fun, it, yeah. it is funny. But yeah. So. Um, I was going to say too, I don't know if you had seen, but I really would have loved for this movie to be cut and dry and it's over. And that's a nice contained fun story. And Gosling's already like, yeah, we kind of leave it in a place where there can, I'm like, we don't need sequels to everything. Yeah, I know. Probably we, we can't let it affect our scores. <laughs> um, Sorry. It's, it's to taken <laughs> 12 points off negative 20. <laughs> we don't need sequels to everything. Oh I am totally in the boat, especially nowadays. Like we need more. They also didn't stories. make enough money. I feel like to pitch for. No, I don't think I don't think they're gonna get a sequel. But he said they leave it in a place in which there can be a second movie. Um, Do they? I don't, yeah, I don't think Do so. They? I also don't want it. So hopefully that doesn't come to fruition. But um, I want to give again a shout out to David Leach because I think the action, choreography, and the stunt stuff is really great in the movie. And um, 
it's obviously a story that was near and dear to his heart and through his experiences that he's had in the industry. So I think it's time for scores. It is. Would you like me to go first or would you like to go? You go, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to give this movie a 7.5. So it is, um, it's an enjoyable movie. It's a fun movie. I would definitely watch it again, but there are some obvious holes um, and flaws with the movie that doesn't put it towards that. Like, oh, it's like one of the most fun movies of the year. Like there are other movies I'm looking forward to. I did enjoy this movie. I do think it's been a weak year relatively so far. Um, but and obviously completely different movies. But to me, Dune and Challengers are still kind of my top two so mm -hmm. far. But what says you? I'm pretty close with you. I'm a little bit lower, though. I'm at a seven okay. solid seven. Um, as somebody who does not watch action films, I was pleasantly surprised just because of the oh, the love letter to stunts, but I just feel like the plot was not there, yeah. um, which bothers me because I am a fully plot storyline ver like I want to hear I want to hear the dialogue um, and instead of it was like, yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways, that's. <laughs> <laughs> oh I'll give it a seven. I'll never watch this movie again, but I recommend it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh my God. Thank you, Liz. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So if you guys have stuck around this long, your review of The Fall Guy, um, starring Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt, directed by David Leach. Thank you guys for tuning in to our episode. Be sure to please give this video a like if you can and comment. Let us know your thoughts on the movie. We love to talk to you guys in the comments and please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell for alerts. We are on the road to 500 subscribers. So it would mean a lot to us if you guys can follow the page. We're also on a lot of different um, social media. You guys can follow us at cinema wave media as well as at underscore culture wave media on Instagram. We're also at cinema wave media on TikToks as well as on threads. And you can also follow us on culture wave on Facebook as well. Just signing off. I am Darian Scalamoni. I am Liz Seiko. And we'll see you guys next time. This is the culture.